Good morning, everyone. Ah, oh, come on, we can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. There we go. Come on in and find your seat if you haven't already done so. Welcome to worship. My name is Dylan. I'm the pastor here at Faith Church. Great to have you with us on this beautiful Lord's Day. A couple of announcements as we enter into our time of worship. Don't forget that next Sunday we are having communion on the concrete. So we're going to gather in here at 1015 like we normally do. And then toward the end of the service, we're going to regather in our preschool building in the unfinished part of the building and celebrate communion over there as well as praying for phase one and all that we believe God is leading us to there. So it's a special Sunday. Make sure you've got your calendar marked and you plan on being with us next Sunday morning at 1015. Um, also, if you didn't see in the email this week, just a reminder that Refuge Worship on Wednesday nights has a new start time. It is now from 6 p.m. to 7.30. Uh, we also are providing pizza for a dollar a slice. It's the best deal in town for all of our students on Wednesday nights. And then also don't forget about connection groups. We've kicked off our fall semester of connection groups. If you haven't found a small group yet, there is one for you. Whatever your age or stage of life, we have groups on Sundays, groups throughout the week. You can find them all on our website. And finally, make sure you are going to our website often, faithrus.org. Sign up for our weekly email update. If you haven't, that goes out every Thursday night. It'll keep you updated on all the things that are happening. And if you're social, please follow us on social media. All right, one more thing this morning, and this is a big day. I love when we have Gospel Partner Sunday, and that's what today is, the day that we welcome our newest group of Gospel Partners who have gone through our Starting Point class. These folks have made professions of faith in Jesus Christ. They've been baptized, and they come today to formally join us on our mission here at Faith Church. Let me give you some good news. Since August of last year, August of 2020, we have had 50 new gospel partners come to Faith Church. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, here's what that means. Look around the room this morning. That means that about one out of every three people is brand spanking new to Faith Church. So there's a lot of folks to greet, a lot of folks to get to know. Make sure you're doing that, all right? Here's our newest gospel partners. When I call your names, if you'll just come find a spot on stage here, I want to pray over you all. So we have Stephen Basteri, who's actually joining us from New York this morning. He's traveling. We have Cindy Bozarth, Robert and Daphne Smith, along with their children, Mackenzie, Sammy, and Tyler. Dennis and Bria Vela, along with their son, Jackson, and then Kira Whiteside. All you guys come on up here and join me on stage, if you will. And yeah, you can give them all a hand. And like we do every time, I'm going to ask you, our other gospel partners, to extend a hand this way as a symbol of your love for these folks and the fact that you're going to be praying for them. So just extend a hand this way as I pray over our new gospel partners. Here we go. Father, we just love you and we thank you so much for how you continue to bring people to partner with us on this mission that you have given us here at Faith Church. We pray today especially for these new gospel partners, for each individual and each family. We pray that you would empower them with your Holy Spirit, that you would guide them with your word, and that you would fill them with your love. We know that you have called them here for a reason, and you have gifted them for ministry. So we pray that they will find opportunities here at Faith Church to use those gifts, and that, Father, you would work in them and through them that you would bring all of us at Faith Church together and passionate about this mission of making disciples of all nations. We pray this in the name of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Give him a hand one more time. Welcome, New Gospel Partners. <laughs> yes, you can go back and be seated. Thank you. And as they go back to their seats, if everybody will stand and let's lift our voices together. Whoa. 
was mine Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glorious day
My name is Kim Gunther, and I oversee the missions here at Faith. And we're so glad that each and every one of you are here. And at this time, we're going to ask our children, age four through grade four, age four through grade four, to head to Kids Cove. Miss Lindsay's already at the door, waiting to uh, head off with you for your time of worship there. There they go. Well, at this time in our service, we set this time apart for each of us to give, to give generously and sacrificially to Faith Church. And there are three ways that you can do so. You can give online. Just scroll down to the Give Now button. You can set up a one-time or recurring gift there if you like, and it'll be all taken care of us. All taken care of us and all taken care of you, for you. Also, we have donation boxes right in the back where you can place your donation and offering there. And if you prefer, if you're online, or if you prefer to do it at home, personally and after prayer, you can mail that check right to the church office. Also at this time, in our service, we like to pray for a nation. And today we're praying for Syria, continent Asia, 18.2 million, and look at that. 0.1 tenth percent of evangelical Christians. <clears throat> this country has been through a lot. In 2011, started a civil war there. Over 400,000 have died. Over 4 million are refugees scattered out and about. And it continues to this day. But as I was praying for Syria and preparing, how can we not mention Afghanistan? And I wondered how close the two countries are. They're about 1,600 miles. If you think about it, an airplane ride here from Tampa to Maine and all the devastation that's going on there, Lord. We're gonna pray for our friends in Afghanistan, our Christians that have decided to remain. I was on a call with World Outreach this week with missionaries who made it out and they are thankful for that, but they are praying and crying out for the family and friends who are left behind. Will you join me in prayer? <clears throat> this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Yes, rejoice, Lord, and be glad in it. Oh, Father God, we come before you today full of praise and thanksgiving. We are thankful for our new gospel partners, for their hearts to serve, share with others, and live out the gospel while growing in their personal relationship with you. Lord, it's been a week. From COVID to wildfires to earthquakes to tropical storms to hurricanes, those right now in the path of Hurricane Ida, to unrest around the world, and there's so much more. We praise you, Lord, no matter what. You are in control with what seems so out of control. You are all powerful and unknowing, and nothing, absolutely nothing, takes you by surprise. We trust you, God. There is a purpose and plan beyond our understanding that your ways are righteous and true, far greater than our ways and you, Lord, are holy and just. Truly, Lord, truly, we thank you for the freedom we have right here today to publicly praise you, to open our Bibles this morning and study your word, to express and share our faith, to be here today worshiping you, the one true God, one true God with no threat, no fear. Today, we pray for the country of Syria. We pray for an end to violence and for solutions that will allow the Syrians a chance to rebuild their lives and nations. We pray for the country of Afghanistan, for discernment for our brothers and sisters in Christ as they decide whether to go or stay in that country. And Lord, if they are to go, make a way providing safe passage and provisions in their new location. And if they are to stay, protect them, Lord. Give them strength. Give them wisdom. 
Give them boldness as they look to new ways to share the gospel under the Taliban control. Give them encouragement. Bring folks up alongside of them, letting them know that they are never alone, that you are with them every step of the way. And Lord, we lift up our military troops that are in or being deployed to Afghanistan right now. Protect them as they give up their safety to serve and help others. For those who gave of their lives this week, be with their families, bringing comfort and peace that passes all understanding. We pray for those in our community, especially for Wednesday and her family, as they wait the arrival of their new life, their new baby brother, but at the same time are praying to you, Lord, for a miracle, a miracle healing, Lord, for Johnny, for dad, to breathe, to take a full deep breath of life, whether it's here on earth or with you. We also pray for Pat Lamb and her family as they grieve the death of her husband, Pete. Give them peace and comfort. We thank you for Evan's progress as he is out of ICU and for continued healing for his full recovery after falling off the roof. We praise you and thank you. And we ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, grab that and let's go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 4 is where we'll be this morning. We're going to look at chapters 4 and 5. And if you don't have a Bible, you will find some Bibles on those tables in the back of the room. We'd love to give you a Bible today. It's a gift, no strings attached. You can grab one now or you can grab one on your way out after worship is over today. And man, I got to tell you, I'm excited. Uh, many of you have already come to me and said that you're really feeling like the Lord is speaking to your heart in this series on Revelation. And you're just eager to see what happens next. And I got to tell you, I am pumped. I've had a lot of coffee. I'm not going to tell you how many cups of coffee I've had, but it is Revelation's number of completion. So there you go. That's how many cups of coffee I've had this morning. So go ahead and stand up with me and let's read some scripture together. We're going to look at Revelation 4 and 5. Things have been good, but today things get really, really good. Let me show you what I mean. Just the first eight verses to get us started. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow, a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion. The second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. So here we are in our third week of the, of the book of Revelation. And as you can tell, there's a lot to unpack in these chapters we're going to be studying today. But I want to, here at the outset, just draw your attention to the series art. And you've probably already noticed the central image here in the series art is a throne. And the reason for that is because the throne is the central image in the book of Revelation. 
And today, you and I get to go with John into the heavenly throne room. Now, in recent decades, there has been this obsession, books written by people who claim to have had dreams or had some near-death experience, and they get a vision of heaven, right? Maybe you know about some of these books. Maybe you've read some of them. I don't want to sound too judgy, but frankly, I don't, I don't tend to take those books seriously. I mean, one of them was written by a man with the last name Malarkey. <laughs> and the book sold over a million copies. And then, after it sold a million copies, he came out and he said that he fabricated the whole thing. So, in fact, the whole thing was, wait for it, malarkey. Like, you can't make this stuff up. But today, we have a reliable, Holy Spirit-inspired account of the heavenly throne room. Who's there? What's it like? What's happening? And what does it mean for us? We're going to look at that today. I've organized this message around the prepositions that we find in chapters 4 and 5. So here's a cool thing about the Bible. Even the tiniest words are full of profound, great theology. It all begins at the throne. At the throne. Chapter 4, verse 1. After this, John says, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven... And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven. Now, there are so many details for us to unpack today. I don't want us to miss the forest for the trees. So I'm going to start with the forest. What's the big idea of chapters 4 and 5? What does all of this mean for us? I think Richard Bauckham says it well. Richard Bauckham is one of the top two or three New Testament scholars in the world today. Some would say he is the top New Testament scholar in the world. And Bauckham argues in his book on the theology of Revelation, he argues that the primary contribution of this book is not a chart of end time events, but a picture of our sovereign God. And here's what Bauckham says in particular about chapter 4. Listen to this. In chapter 4, God's sovereignty, His power, is seen as it is already fully acknowledged in heaven. This establishes it as the true reality which must, in the end, also prevail on earth. On earth, the powers of evil challenge God's rule and even masquerade as the ultimate power over all things, claiming divinity. But heaven is the sphere of ultimate reality. What is true in heaven must become true on earth. So what are chapters 4 and 5 all about? I think the best way to sum it up is with the words that Jesus himself gave us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. Here we get a glimpse of what it's like in heaven. What is true, what is real, and what is true in heaven must become true on earth. So what is it, what is it that John sees? This is John, the writer of Revelation. We know he's on Patmos. He's exiled there. He's a political outcast. He took a stand against the Roman government. They didn't like it, so they sent him to Patmos, this island prison. In chapter 1, he had a vision of Jesus, one like a son of man, standing amidst the churches. And now he has another vision. Now he sees a door standing open in heaven. Now notice here that John is not transported somewhere else, somewhere far, far away. No, he, he sees this door right in front of him. In sermons past, we've talked about the thin places. Those places in this creation that are just so full of beauty and majesty. You go there and you sense that the, the barrier, the boundary between heaven and earth is unusually thin in those places. We all have thin places. Maybe it's the beach, maybe it's the mountains. Well, on this day, the thin place has a door. And Jesus opens the door. See, John is not going somewhere up there, far away. No, no, this is, a, this is another dimension of reality. He sees it 
right in front of him. He sees what's happening. And the first thing he sees is a throne. A throne in heaven. John sees and he wants us to know that there is a seat of power. There is a control center of the universe. Now at times we're tempted to think that there's not one. Because we watch current events of our day. We read about the things that are happening in Afghanistan. And all the natural disasters that are occurring all around us. And we read about the COVID surge. And so we're tempted to think that there's not a control center of the universe. But remember the fundamental message of Revelation. Things are not as they seem. What we need is for someone to pull back the curtain. To show us the true reality. To show us the throne. And that's what we see here. There is a control center of the universe. There is a throne. But it's not an empty throne. There is also someone on the throne. Verse 2. At once I was in the spirit and behold a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And then in verse 8. The creatures that are gathered around this throne, what is it that they're singing? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. It's not only that there is a control center of the universe, that there is a throne, but there is one seated on the throne, and it's not the emperor of Rome. You've got to hang with me on this part. You've got to remember the context of the day. Rome did everything they could to claim sovereignty over the world at the time this letter was written. It was a complex political system. We talked about it a little bit last week, and everything was designed to communicate the message that Rome sits on the throne of the world. So this central image of the book of Revelation, the throne, which will occur in almost every chapter from here on out, it appears almost 50 times in the book. It is a theological symbol for sure, but it's also a political and a polemical symbol. The point here is that, yes, someone sits on the throne, and it is not Domitian. It is not the emperor. Who is it? It's the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's what the creatures gathered around the throne sing again, again, and again. Whenever someone comes to me and they say, you know what, I don't really like modern praise music because it's too repetitive. You know where I always take them? Revelation 4. You're not going to like it in heaven either because this is an ancient and endless chorus. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God's holiness, this is the fundamental attribute of God, the summary attribute. His holiness is his otherness. He's unlike, set apart from all the rest of creation because he is the creator, the eternal God, the one who was and is and is to come. He is the one seated on the throne at the very center of the control of the universe. But it gets even better. Notice what comes from the throne. Verse 5. From the throne come flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. As we trace this imagery throughout the biblical story, the thunder and the lightning, we learn that these are ways of communicating God's power, His unparalleled power. Think about the book of Exodus. When God's people are camped at Sinai, When Moses is summoned up the mountain to meet with God, what is it that the people hear and see? Thunder and lightning. And the people and the entire mountain, they all tremble. This God, seated on the throne of the universe, He is terribly powerful. And He's also terribly merciful. Because there's also a rainbow in this scene. You notice that? Around the throne, near the throne, there's a rainbow. 
Another Old Testament image, it comes from Genesis 9. It's a symbol of God's mercy, His faithfulness. So don't you see what type of God this is who sits on the throne? This is the type of God who is holy, who is set apart, who is all-powerful, and who welcomes unholy people, sinners like us, into His presence. In this case, it's safe to run toward the lightning. In this case, that, that noise you hear that causes you to tremble is God's thunderous love. He is the Lord God Almighty, and He welcomes us into His presence. Oh, but it gets even better. Keep reading. There is something else before the throne. Before the throne, we're burning seven torches of fire which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. Seven, you know this number well by now, I hope. Seven is the number of completion or completeness in Revelation. So the seven spirits of God is Revelation's preferred way of speaking of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fully, completely present. There's also something else before the throne, a sea, a sea of glass. Now, in Revelation, the sea is a symbol of chaos, of evil, of all that threatens God's will and His work. And if you think about it, it this imagery makes sense. In the ancient world, people feared the sea because they didn't really understand it very well. It was large. Its depths were unexplored. So it's easy to see why they feared the sea. Even modern man, don't, don't you find yourselves wondering sometimes, looking at the vastness of the sea, the depth of the sea, and just wondering, what lives down there? What's down there? So it's, it's easy to see why the sea can be a symbol of chaos. But here at the throne of God, all chaos is calm. The sea is like glass. All chaos is calm at the throne. Even more amazing than that is the fact that chaos has a place at the throne. Chaos itself bows before the throne of God. Now, don't you understand what that means? That means that all evil and suffering, all the chaotic forces of this world, even now, are somehow bowing before the throne. Somehow fulfilling God's good and sovereign purposes. Now hang with me, that doesn't mean that God sends pain and suffering to you, but it does mean that He bends it. You see the difference? He doesn't necessarily send it into your life, but He will bend it. He will form you. He will fashion that unfortunate event into something that forms you into the person He wants you to become. The sea, chaos itself, bows before the throne. Now this means that you and I, Never need to panic. Now, did you hear what I said? Those of you who know me well and you've heard me preach for years, you will know this about me. You know I'm a lover of precision. You will know that I've been trained to craft words carefully. I did not say we rarely need to panic. I did not say we almost never need to panic. I said we never need to panic because chaos itself, even now, bows before the throne of God. One day, He will wipe the world clean of pain and suffering and all chaotic forces. At the end of Revelation, the sea is no more. We'll see that, but even now, it bows. And therefore, we don't panic. We praise Oh, but there's even more. We're not done yet. There are also creatures gathered around the throne. Around the throne were 24 thrones. Seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white, with golden crowns on their heads. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second, an ox. The third with the face of a man, and the fourth like an eagle in flight. 
these strange beings, very mysterious, and we also see that they're doing something very specific. We'll get to the, the activity, what they're doing in a minute. First, who are these beings and what do they mean for us? You know that numbers are symbolic. We've already seen a couple of them. Seven, the number of completeness or completion. Ten also is the number of completion. These are based on the Old Testament, the seven days of creation, the ten commandments, the numbers of completion. Here we have the number 24 for the first time. The number 24 represents the redeemed community of God's people. 24 is the sum of 12 and 12. The 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles of Jesus. So the number 24 represents the entire redeemed community, both before and after the coming of Jesus. The 24 elders are heavenly beings who represent the church throughout time. We also have the four living creatures. Four is the number of the earth, the number of creation, the four corners of the earth. The four living creatures represent all of animate creation. So put these images together, the 24 elders and the four living creatures, and what we have is a picture of all of the church and all of creation. The specific images that are given here represent different parts of creation. The lion, the noblest part. The ox, the strongest part. The human, the wisest part. And the eagle, the swiftest. So all of the church, all of creation. And what is it that around the throne they're doing? We have to keep reading to find out. Around the throne... Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will they existed and were created. All of the church, all of creation, worshiping the almighty God who is seated on the throne. Worshiping. The living creatures, the 24 elders, all saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God. Worthy was the word that citizens were expected to use when the emperor came into their city. But here in the heavenly throne room, they know better. They know that there's only one who is worthy. Because there's only one who created us, who sustains us, who redeems us, and it's not the emperor. It's the one seated on the throne. They worship the one seated on the throne. See, the knowledge of God and the worship of God, they are inseparable. When you know God, when you truly know Him, then you know that you must worship Him alone. He is your creator, your provider, your redeemer. He alone is worthy of worship. And yet, strangely enough, there is one more here in the heavenly throne room who is worshipped. It's not just the one seated on the throne. There's something else going on in chapter 5. There is another who is standing between the throne, between the throne and the living creatures. Chapter 5, one of the elders said to me, said to John, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Now let me bring you up to speed here. What's happening in chapter 5? Chapter 5 is an extension of this same vision of the heavenly throne room. It started in chapter 4. But now John sees the one seated on the throne... The Almighty God, and in His right hand is a scroll. The scroll, or the book, represents the plan of God. 
the plan for all of humanity and all of creation itself. And this scroll has seven seals. So it is the complete plan of God. But who is worthy? Who is worthy to open and to implement such a plan? An angel, a mighty angel, appears to John and he calls. Who is worthy? Who can open this scroll? And no one steps forward. So John begins to weep. And as he weeps, that's when one of the elders says to him, Weep no more. Weep no more. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has conquered. He can open the scroll and its seven seals. And so John is picturing a lion. He's expecting to turn and see so savage a beast that it will guarantee a victory, right? And what does he see? He sees a lamb, not a lion, a lamb. What's happening here? All of these images are going back to the Old Testament. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. These are images of the Old Testament pointing to the coming of the Messiah, God's anointed one who would come one day and who would lead God's people to victory. But now John sees not a lion, but a lamb. Or, even better, a lion lamb. One being. But the second image is telling us how the lion conquers. You remember in week one of this series when I told you that according to the book of Revelation and really all of the New Testament, we are living in the end times now. But we have been for a long time. According to the Bible... The death and resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of the end times. So we're in the end game now, but we have been for a long time. The end times is the entire church age. And throughout the church age, according to Revelation, there will be an ongoing battle between good and evil. And every generation must fight. But now we're learning something about how we fight. Who is this lion lamb? It's Jesus. Of course it is. It's Jesus because he conquered by laying down his life. He conquered not by some savage strength, but by sacrificing himself. John expects to see the lion, this savage animal, and he turns to see a sacrificial animal, a lamb. Jesus conquers by going to the cross. Revelation 5 is teaching us that the most powerful force in the universe is sacrificial love and for those of us who are believers who are followers of the lamb we will conquer we will win this battle by going the way of the cross by following the lamb by being lamb like by bearing witness to jesus even as we suffer even as we die this is how He conquers. And this is how we, his people, conquer. The lion lamb, the God-man, Jesus, he is the one who is worthy to open the scroll. The contents of the scroll, we'll get to that in future weeks. But there's one other scene here at the end of Revelation 5. When Jesus is recognized, the lion lamb, the one who's worthy to open this scroll, There's a scene of praise that erupts right after this. But it's ever-expanding praise. It starts with one circle and then it gets wider and wider and wider. Until in the end, the final words of the chapter, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. Every creature, you name it. To him who sits on the throne and To the Lamb, Jesus, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. So you see the heavenly throne room, this scene, it ends with ever-expanding worship, ever-expanding peace and purpose and praise. Now remember the words from Richard Bauckham that I read to you at the very beginning. What is true in heaven 
must become true on earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this scene of the heavenly throne room and the incredible encouragement it provides for us today. Lord, it's so easy to look out at the world and to think nobody's in control of this place. Oh, but God, forgive us for the times we have thought like that. Because what we've seen today, we know you are on the throne. Even now, the sea and all the forces of chaos, they bow before you. This doesn't mean that we always understand what's happening in this life. It doesn't mean that we always understand what's happening in our own families. But we can trust you. We can trust that you are good and you are almighty. You are reigning now in heaven. And what is true in heaven must, must, must become true on earth. Oh, encourage our hearts with that beautiful truth this morning. We need it. We need it. In Jesus' name, the Lamb's name. Amen. We all stand.
if you want to talk or pray with someone before you leave today, the Holy Spirit's been working in your heart, or you're just going through a tough time in life, I'll be here at the front. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to meet you. If you're our guest, thank you for being with us today. We're especially glad that you were here. If you'll swing by our Connection Center, the little desk to the right in the foyer, we have a small gift for you, and we hope to see you again soon. Uh, like we do every week, we're going to read the words of the Great Commission together. We've gathered to be equipped, discipled, encouraged to worship, and now we scatter to go out on this mission to serve our Lord Jesus by serving others. So say these words with us. Here we go. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. You're dismissed.